Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's get started. I know that there's a few more folks who are trickling in, but it's 10.05, so we, we want to stick to the schedule. schedule. It's going to be a long day. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Marius Papa Eftimiu. I'm the dean for the Donald Brand School of Information and Computer Sciences. It's exciting to see uh, so many people converge uh, here today for the symposium on AI and biomedicine. I want to welcome everyone. Uh, AI is in, 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 in everyone's uh, mind, I guess, these days, uh, but in ICS, it has been in our minds since uh, 1968 when the school was founded. Uh, one of the founders of the school, Julian Feldman, was an expert in AI. Uh, there was a lot of activity in this school in the 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s in uh, machine learning, well, when it wasn't really the talk of, uh, of, of, of the town. Um, the machine learning data repository that came out of UC Irvine in the 90s was the first public repository uh, for big data uh, that, that, that came out there. And in the past few years, uh, the school has been growing in, in AI, uh, hiring one or two new faculty every year for four or five years now in a row in, the, in that broader space. So we will be doing more in AI, in, in ICS. We want to share what we do with uh, the rest of the campus and with the rest of the community around us. Uh, one of the things that we will be launching in the next few months is an institute for AI. It's, it's meant to be a hub for all the AI activity on campus and a way to, to uh, interface with uh, other units on campus and with the community around the campus. Uh, so. Uh, I don't want to take more time. You have many more interesting things to hear in the, in the rest of the day. Uh, once again, I want to welcome you. I want to make sure you know that there's going to be uh, a sequence of symposia like this uh, for the foreseeable future, pretty much once every quarter on different uh, topics related to AI. So stay tuned. There's going to be much more opportunity to learn about what's happening in this exciting space. Um, that's all I have. I want to uh, ask Professor Pierre Baldi to come to the podium and say a few things about uh, what will be happening today. And uh, wish everyone an exciting time. I will be here for a big part of the day, and I look forward to seeing you around and talking to you during the breaks. Pierre. Thank you, Marius. Uh, Welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to, to see all of you here. Uh, we are running a little bit late, so I will uh, not uh, waste much time here, but I want to thank our sponsors, the School of ICS and the Institute for Genomics and Bioinformatics, and their staff who have been instrumental in putting together the symposium, in particular Janet Coe, who did uh, a lot of the heavy lifting. and. Um, I think it's going to be a very fun day. We have a wonderful uh, roster of speakers and uh, food and drinks and uh, the restrooms are on the right. If you come out of the auditorium and you don't know this building, uh, go to your right. And without further ado, let me introduce the first speaker, Professor Shaoli Xie from the Department of uh, Computer Science, who is going to talk to us about applications of AI, machine learning, in particular deep learning, to problems in genomics and also in biomedical image analysis. These technologies are uh, very versatile and can be applied to all kinds of different problems. So, shall we? So, uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me in the back? So, uh, thank you, Pierre. Thank you, Marius, for the uh, opportunity to uh, speak here today. We're going to talk about some of the work my group has been doing on applying AI and uh, machine learning to solve some of the problems in biology and medicine. So, uh, as you are all aware that now AI is in everyday product. Whether you realize or not, so you are more or less using some of the daily, in, in your daily life, we're using many of the AI product. And uh, driven by recent advances in computer vision, in natural language processing, and also in many other machine learning applications, recommender systems, and uh, with a wide range of the applications. So many of these products and those, uh, 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 these, those results here, um, some of the recently are driven by these techniques called uh, deep learning. 
So this algorithm here is not new, but it's driven, inspired by what happens within the brain here. So what we do in the deep learning is that we use this kind of a, these techniques called neural networks here to learn the hierarchical representations of features of the input data sets here. And train purely based on data here, input data sets here. You have input data, and you want to predict, some, you want to expect to produce some of the output here. We are you taking a data-driven approaches here using those kind of a neural net approaches here to learn a hierarchical representations of feature of the input data here. And that's the, these are the, these are tech, the, the key techniques underlying most, uh, many of the recent progress in this field. And people have made a lot of progress in wide range of applications. So in the uh, computer vision field here, people is, are able to drive, increase the accuracy of object recognition from the uh, over less than probably six, seven years ago, the error rate of object recognition is still over around 28%. With these techniques of deep learning, we are able to reduce the error rate from 28% to more recently close to 2.3%. And uh, many people believe that this error rate is even doing smaller than what we human can do on this for the task of object recognition. And uh, also, this techniques has also been applied in many other fields here. For instance, in speech recognition, in this case here, we want to recognize a sound waves and convert to text output here. And this deep learning techniques is able to reduce error rate by 30 to 40% using those type techniques. Also, a lot of progress in many other fields. Another one people talk a lot about is this machine translation. So now, those kind of deep learning inspired algorithms, something called a neural machine translation methodology is able to kind of uh, uh, doing a very good work for translating those language from English to other languages to Spanish, French, Chinese, etc. At a level to accuracy, now is closing the gap to the human levels, of, uh, the accuracy of human level translations. So uh, people have a lot, lot of progress in many different types of fields here. So in my group here at the ICS, what we are thinking about is this, how can we use in those type of recent progress in the AI and the deep learning to, and use these techniques here to advance knowledge in science, especially in biology and also in medicine. So this is something kind of driven the, some of the research activities in my group of that. So in the, uh, in the uh, bio field here, we have uh, Tons of data sets. The biomedical big data covers many different types of data sets here, ranging from different, uh, different, from different scale, different aspect that. It starts from the clinical data sets here, from a large scale, can go zoom into very detailed scale here, go to the molecular scale. We have a lot of data sets from genomic scale as well. And also there's a lot of imaging scale data sets. So look at the anatomies, what happens within, through the uh, CT, and MRI, and ultrasound image of that. So my group here, today I'm going to mainly talk about what we have been doing in this uh, genomics field and also in this medical imaging field here. How do we utilize deep learning to advance knowledge in these two particular fields of that? So first of all, I want to say something about the genomics here. So this is a chart that tells us how much we know about the human genomes. So human genome itself is not new, has been sequenced over, you know, over 10 years, 15 years ago. So we know exactly what is the sequence of nucleotides within the human genome. But what we don't know are the, what are the information encoded within the genomes. So this is a chart here. I, I, I present these slides here. When I give a job talk here at the UCI over 10 years ago, I still able to use this chart here because fundamentally this chart is more or less stays the same. So what happens is that human genome is still poorly understood. So in this genome here, roughly 1.5% represent the coding regions here, but the majority of the genome, vast majority of the genomes here, represent these non-coding regions here, and we, essentially we don't know much what about the functions encoded with these non-coding regions and genomes. And these are important to know because many of the human genetic variations are happen within those re non-coding regions here. And uh, at current stage, we don't know how this genetic variation might impact the functions of the genome, lead to the health effect of that. So, uh, so, the, so the question is, how do we address these questions here? So, well, so human genome here is simply a sequence of nucleotides here, but we have a lot of kind of readout from the genomes. 
primarily through the techniques that recently developed by reading out through the so-called epigenetic modifications of genomes. So the idea is that nucleotide sequence here is, is inherited by everyone, shared by all the cells with the human genomes here, but each cells here have different types of epigenetic modifications reflected in these histone modifications and also DNA methylations here. And recently, biologists have developed lots of high throughput techniques to read out those signals fr from the genomes in a genome-wide fashion here, using techniques such as ChIP-seq and uh, DNA-seq and ATAXI here. So these techniques are great because they can read out those nucle nucleotide level resolutions throughout the genomes of there. So the question here is, is how this will be useful for understanding the human genomes. So what we did here is that we take some of the techniques we use that has been successfully applied for the image analysis. There is this technique called convolutional neural nets has been successfully applied for extracting features from the images. And we thought we probably can apply this type of convolutional neural nets idea to the DNA sequence as well. So we applied, we developed some of the models here. We applied this convolution to the DNA sequence to extract features. And with these features, we hope to be able to predict those type of epigenetic modification signals, and we are able to read out from genome using these high throughput techniques here. And essentially what we're doing here, we build up this mapping here from the DNA sequence to this merit of tons of, few dozens of uh, epigenetic modifications here. We are asking the algorithm to learn what we can learn from the DNA sequences. So that's the goal of this program. We develop a methodology, something called a factor net here, to read out these signals here. So it turns out pretty successful. What is it, why, how is it successful? Because once we learn those signals here, learn the information from the DNA sequence output here, what do we can do here? We can make a perturbations on the input here. So we make a mutation on some of the nucleotides, and then we study how those mutations here might impact the output here. And that information is useful for us to understand what will be the functional consequence of the DNA mutations happen within the genome side of that. So by doing that, we are able to kind of annotate the human genomes using this kind of a computational methodology, utilizing those high throughput data sets people have been produced and made publicly available data sets of that. And so, so without any experimental kind of you know, the techniques to kind of make mutations in the genome, that is really is very, in many cases, not possible to do. And we will be apply this kind of a similar type of techniques here to understand how the gene regulation relate to each other and, and relate, to each other, relate to each other here. So even though the idea, even though in the human we have 20,000 genes, the expression is that, but however, those genes are highly correlated with each other. You can study, de decouple those genes here and focus on the small, sub small sub subset of genes. In fact, you only need to probably know 1,000 genes to be able to reconstruct the regression program, the expression program of the entire set of genes. So these are some of the activities we have been doing in this uh, applying the deep learning in the genomics field here. So that I just roughly give the overview of what we've been doing here, and then we'll be happy to talk about it after meetings for some of the detailed follow-up, some of the works here. So the, uh, the second part of the work we have been doing is on applying kind of deep learning for the medical image analysis. So that as, we, as we all know, that medical image has become a very essential part of the medical diagnosis and in, the, in, in, the, in, in, in healthcare here. So for medical image analysis, there are many different types of applications we, usually we have to think about here. So one is for the segmentation. Usually, one, once you're presented with this medical images here from the CT or MRI here, we like to segment out those different lesions or organs from the image side of that. And then once you segment those lesions here, you can quantify them. You can measure the size. You can say, is this lesions here, how big it is? What's the progression during the time of that? And we also want to localize the lesions of that. We want to automatically detect lesions from the image side of that. And uh, so, that, so recently, a lot of progress in this field here, applying many of the techniques we learned from the computer vision to this side here. So today, today I want to introduce some of the project that has been going in my group here to try to tackle these problems here. I want to start with one of the problem, problems here we have spent some time on is these techniques on the, uh, on the early detection of lung cancer from low-dose CT images. 
So as many of you all know that it's kind of lung cancer has become increasingly become a problem. It's one of the major, major cause of mortality, cancer mortality in the US, also in the developing world as well. So they, however, people discovered that this kind of low dose CT screening is actually very helpful for, for to reduce the mortality of lung cancer. So the idea if this lesions can cut early, can reduce mortality significantly. I quote a number here, I say reduction 20%. Recently I got a number saying that up to 20 to 40% of mortality can be avoided if we can detect those lung cancer in the early stage of that. So there's a lot of incentive to detect this from the low dose CT images. So what do we look at from low dose CT are those kind of small lesions, we call it nodules here, highlighted in this, in this red circles here. So what, we, what the, usually what the radiologists are looking for are looking for those type of, uh, looking at this type of small nodules in this, in this diagram here. You want to detect them from the CT image of that. So however, it's actually very challenging to detect those pulmonary nodules from the CT image for multiple reasons. So one of the reasons is that many of these nodules here are very small. And many nodules here, especially for early detection lung cancer here, can be less than three millimeters. It's very challenging to detect those nodules here. And also, in addition, you can see from this slide here, there's not much difference to separate these nodules here from many other bright spots you see from the CT image of that. Because those bright spots can come from the vessels of the, uh, in, the, in the lung regions of that. So not, this is not the only challenge. The other challenge is that, so typically, we, when radiologists look at the image here, they look at the volume of the CT image from the cross-section of many different regions of that. You have a cross-section of the lung here go from different regions. Typically, you look at the 300 or 400 slides of the image here, and radiologists need to go through each one of them, carefully identify possible lesions from the images. So that is pretty a kind of a time-consuming task here. And in general, there's a lot of false positive and false negatives when radiology examines those CT images for, de for detecting those pulmonary, from pulmonary nodules. So what we've been doing here is that we're trying to, develop a, try to develop a kind of a deep learning algorithm here to automatically detect those lesions here with the CT, within the CT image of that. So what we want to do is that, given the previous kind of a volume of CT image here, we want to automatically highlight what are the potential nodules within the CT regions of that. So I try to find a... Let me see a later point here. But so the idea in this in this in this uh, kind of this uh, animation here, what I, what I have here. Okay, good. Okay. Great. So what we did here is that we highlight those potential lesions here from from the here, and then radiologists here don't need to go through the entire volume slides here. They can just focus on the small subset of them here. And uh, what we did here, we so what we did here is that we trained a, a, a model, something called a convolution net, but different from the conventional convolution that is based on these uh, 2D images. In this case here, it's in fact, it's very important to recognize that those lesions here, the features have to gain from three-dimensional features of the lesion there. So what we did, we trained a three-dimensional convolution net. We twisted around different models here, given these whole volume of CT images, and what do we, in the end, we try to highlight the possible lesions from CT image, as shown in the previous kind of uh, video animations of that. So, uh, so what do we do right now is that we have actually developed online systems, <laughs> online systems here. So in these online systems that you can provide, it, you can upload your CT images, and then we can automatically highlight potential lesions from the CT images of that. What we did here is this, in the left side here, we have a list of potential nodules within the, this, the CT images here, and we also quantify them. We quantify what is the volume of the images, because once we detect them, we can segment out those lesions and automatically calculate what is the volume of this image here, and we calculate the intensity of the image, and also we classify them, what are the possible categories of this pulmonary nodules here. We have a list of the tables here, and with this tools here, and the radiologist can simply click on one of them here, and look at them. If it's, yes, it can copy those, uh, those, those reports here and generate report automatically. So right now we are collaborating with the UCI radiology department. We hopefully put this in the clinical trial to see, put this in the real application usage of that. So that's one of the application we have been doing on kind of how to analyze medical image. This part here focuses on primarily on the detection part. We want to detect lesions here. So how accurate is this, is this tool here? 
And we have, we have to test on a publicly available data set, a very large scale data set, something called an LIDC data set here. And this, this, this chart here primarily quantifies the detection accuracy. Essentially say, I have lesions here, how accurate you can put your bounding box in those regions, automatically detect them here. And this shows you the chart with different rate of false positive rate, rate here. What are the sensitivity of this methodology here? So essentially what this chart is saying that right now we, we, we are able to achieve, say, if you're allowed to report, let's say, eight pulmonary nodules within each patient, and then you get a sensitivity of close to 96%. Essentially, you can capture majority of the true lesions here. True lesions here, if you are wanted to go through eight nodules, but, but sometimes people don't not want to go through many of them, and then you can go down the list here and say, if I only want to check one nodule here per patient, and then the detection rate would be 87% accuracy of that. So this will be quantification what the current state of the art in this field here for this kind of pulmonary nodule detection part of that. So the second problem, and many people are interested in knowing this, once you detect these lesions here, you, I want to know is this a malignant lesion or a benign lesion? So it turns out that the majority of those uh, lesions here, in the end, turns out to be benign, so we don't need to worry too much about it. But it's very important that we want to know, be able, be able to tell whether the lesion is, is a malignant one here, because this is the one here we need to follow very closely. So we also check this so-called classification accuracy on the lesion part of that. So our system, we are able to achieve like 86% accuracy compared to the uh, accuracy provided by the radiologist. So these are top experts in this field here. The accuracy is about 83% here. So we can probably, at least for this data set here, we can confidently say that not only we can detect lesions with a high accuracy here, but also we can report these labels, right? Whether well, there's malignant ones here, classification accuracy, better than radiologists here for this particular data set here. But for the, in general, that's really we want to test in the real clinical applications. We collaborate with the radiologist at the UCI here to, to test real, real accuracy for the real patient data sets here. So, so this is the one that's here, and then we're going to have not much time here. I'll go through some of the quick demos of what I have for some other application we have in this field here. So the ones I just talked about here is this kind of detection here. We also did a lot of some of this called segmentation, address some of the segmentation problem from the CT images here. So what I show you here is this. CT image, when they're given to you here, are kind of grayscale image here. What we did here, we highlight those CT images with different colors. What do these colors mean? Well, this color means essentially represent different organs within the CT image. Right now, what I represent here are CT image from the head and neck regions of that. What do we did here, we paste those colors on top of the CT image, and then we automatically highlight what are the possible important organs within the CT image here. And in the, in the end here, we also can reconstruct three-dimensional structures of the organs directly from the volume CT image of that. And you can see what are the different organs relate to each other here. And what's the purpose for this type of application? What, there are multiple purposes of that. So one purpose is that for anomaly detections here. By doing this here, we can automatically check the volume to see if there's anything unusual for any particular organs within the head and sick regions here. Automatically provide you both automatic quantification of that. So there's also other applications. So this application relates to something called a um, Called, uh, the, uh, called the radiation therapy. In the, in the radiation therapy field here, we, and it's actually required to delineate all the different regions because we want to protect those important organs from the radiations here. So there's a lot of application in this field of that. So I'm going to skip that so they, so they uh, pick in the interest of the time here. So we have done a lot of application, not only from this kind of CT images on the MRI image, but also on the other modality side of that. So this is some of the work we have been doing of MRI image under the microscope here. And this is the one here, is a lot of application in the pathology department in the medicine side of there. So this shows you a public data set of check what are the lesions in the lymph nodes associated with whether the breast cancer tumors has invaded lymph nodes. What the pathologist took is took a, a, a biopsy, a slide of the lymph node, and put they under the microscope, and they kind of kind of color them. Now you can see different cells within the uh, slides here. What are we doing here? We want to kind of automatically detect those uh, tumor potential cancer cells within the patho pathology slides of that. And um, so sometimes those slides here are very complicated because cells grow in many different shapes. What we are be able to do here, we can automatically segment out potential tumor cells, and by doing that, we can quantify them. 
Okay, say how many of the areas, how many cells, what fraction of cells are tumor cells, what type of tumor cells we might have within the slice of that. So that's another application that's related in the detected regions and with pathology slides of that. So we are not only limited to that, we also can apply to natural images here. So this is some of the work we have been doing on, the, on detecting movement disorders, associated with movement disorder here. You can see from this video slide, what you see here is that, so this patient here has a lot of tremors in the hand tremors lab. This is a more or less a hallmark of this Parkinson's disease. What do we do? What we do here, we can automatically detect the hand poses, detect region, and then we quantify them how much is this tremor this patient has. We can, by doing that, we can set up a system to automatically monitor the progressions of the disease and, then see, and also for, see the, what is the effect once you apply the medication to this patient here, and to be able to quantify this automatic here. So I'm gonna skip this part here in the interest of time here. I just wanna wrap up here. I, what, right, what I show you here is some of the, some of the applications that are ongoing in my lab in my group at the ICS here. And it relates to kind of how to use deep learning to address problems in genomics and also in the medical image study of that. I just want to mention some of the potential challenges, even though people talk about a lot of progress has been made in this field of that, but there are a lot of challenges in this field as well. So one of the major challenges is that the kind of the data dimension associated with medical image is extremely high here. And typically we are dealing with a high dimensional and three three dimensional data sets here from CT and MRI here. So typically, the traditional method here cannot be easily transferred to apply to solve this problem here. And the question is, how do we solve the problem, right? So another aspect of here, usually the data set, training data sets here is much smaller than what we have typically for the natural images. And uh, because of many reasons here. And first of all, these data sets here need to be annotated by experts. And typically, we, this type of data set is not easily readily available. And once, even though they are available, they're not publicly available, so you don't have access to the sets here. There's a question of how to address these kind of issues with that. The secondly, the question is this. So there's not there enough transparency within this domains as well. So unlike many other machine learning fields here, people are very willing to share data, share models in the public domain. And this domains here, people, because of, the, you know, for legitimate reasons, because of the privacy issues, people tend to not release data, not release the models. So that is somewhat hindered the progress in this field here. But in general, I'm very excited, very, very, very kind of, a, very positive that this AI here is going to make a big impact on this on the, for the futures of the healthcare here because it's so obvious here many of the techniques here we already see has tremendous benefit for making diagnosis for detection of lesions of that and uh, can reduce the cost as well reduce the accuracy and efficiency as well but uh, still we, but on the other hand we need to address some of the challenges on data data annotation sharing and also mass transparency of that. And uh, I, uh, so I believe that combine this kind of a deep learning based kind of data driven approaches with some of the expert knowledge of the prior probabilistic model might be useful for this field as well. So, uh, so in the end, I just want to acknowledge some of the students, group of students in my group has been participating in various projects. I, I, I talk about it here and I'll acknowledge some of the, uh, my colleagues in the ICS and uh, my grant support from NIH and NSF and also centers supported my research at the UCI here. Thank you. It's time for a couple of questions. Or shall we? What are the perils of this? What are the they? cons? Sorry, the perils, the cons. Oh, the parallel. Dangers. Right. So, yeah. So, what, so the what the area is this runs here, right? So the 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 especially for biomedical image side, there's a lot of variations. It says, uh, so when, even though we say we make a very good progress, high accuracy on this particular data set, but the important thing is that you need to put those models in the real practice. And in many cases, when you general, in the, we want to see how, how general uh, this kind of performance of the models here, when you apply to new data sets in real time of that. So this is sometimes a very easy to see system can break down when you apply it in real practice that. This is something we have to, we have to think about here. So the other aspect that, there's a lot of hype in this field here. You can think that AI can solve all the problems. I don't think it can solve the problem here. So my perspective is this. The AI here provides a tool to assist in the radiologist to doctors to make a diagnosis here, not to replace them. I think more or less from this perspective, that's much better here. Certainly, the, and the good side of that is certainly we can improve the accuracy and improve efficiency. There's a lot of benefits associated.
One more question, Ora. I'm wondering if you can see in the future that some of those techniques can be used for screening programs, uh, or are they mostly diagnostic at the film side? Yes, yes, that's right. That, that's actually a very good question here. So, the, uh, so therefore, diagnosis is actually a lot of a stringent requirement for many of the tools because the accuracy is very important for for screening per, for the for diagnosis purpose. For screening purpose here, and uh, it's, I think it's actually a better application for many of the techniques because we tolerate certain levels of posit false positives because once you have false positives, you can follow up with many of this, uh, the tests here. So in fact, for the first project I described for the pulmonary nodule detection, that are primarily used for screening purpose because uh, and uh, even if you have false positives, we, we can have expert follow up them. So that's, uh, I, I think it's a better application for many of the techniques here. Thank you. We need to move on. Thank you, Sherwin. Thank you very much. Yeah. Our next speaker is a real MD from our School of Medicine, Daniel Chow, who is also leading the AI Diagnostic Institute. And he will be talking to us about to engaging physicians in medical artificial intelligence research. I'm a radiologist uh, over at UC Health, and I changed the title talk to the engaging clinicians rather than just physicians because I think it's important to remember that you know the clinical team is not just doctors, but it's also our nurses, our PAs, our clinical coordinators, and that really is uh, a larger group. So I thought this is an interesting topic for how to engage our community in doing um, medical AI research. If I can get this to work. So I kind of broke up the talk into two sections. So first is to why to, why to collaborate with clinicians and also how to engage clinicians. So I think for the why, you know, a lot of things that we think commonly is that, you know, clinicians have access to data, clinicians know how to annotate data because we have some of that clinical expertise. But I think that there are a few things that are also important to highlight to motivate us to work with clinicians. And first is domain expertise, uh, knowing what the clinical need is, and also tackling that uh, last uh, point step for clinical integration. Uh, you know, Xiaoli talked about this uh, before, and you know, as an example, is that medical data is very complex. Uh, I think most of us know what the ImageNet challenge was, and that was to identify, you know, from different photographs what the objects were, you know, dog, cat, horse, you know, etc. Um, and one of the initial early challenges was from the dream, the dream group was to apply this tool to mammographic data to identify breast cancers. Now we can instantly see a challenge is that you know. Color pictures are typically 256 by 256 pixel size, whereas mammograms can range from 3,000 to 3,000 to up to 6,000 pixel size. So they are a significant order of magnitude higher and larger. One of the initial groups, what they had tried to do was, you know, they wanted to have this size of a mammogram fit into a traditional uh, image neural unit. And so what they did was they took the images, downsized it to fit into the architecture because it was the mammogram was so large they couldn't load it entirely uh, for single training. One of the challenges though is that we know for mammographers, what we're looking for is we're looking for very, very punty calcifications. And when they downsized the samples to fit the architecture, they downsized the way to find them completely. And they sat around maybe about 50 to 55% accuracy for that first generation. Um, and so one of the things that's happened now since is that the new winners for the dream challenges and even our own work is that, you know, we talk to mammographers and we say, how do you approach an image? And you know, what we do is we go uh, piece by piece, uh, we go region by region, and we were able to magnify certain areas. And so by approaching the images for how a clinician approaches it and having that extra small bit of domain expertise, we're able to improve our results. So I think that's you know, the first thing to recognize is just because we have really you know, very exciting potential tools, translating to medical data is sometimes challenging and having that extra domain expertise is very, very helpful. 
And I think that's one of the, the classic challenges that we have is that we have a lot of tools and we don't really know what is the clinical need, what is the application. You know, we, we have a situation where we have a lot of hammers and everything starts looking like a nail. So this is the second part for why to engage with clinicians, and I think it's understanding what our clinical need is. So this is, I'm a radiologist, and this is my work list. And on a standard day, um, you know, our turnaround time nationally is about maybe two to four hours. At UCI, we do a pretty good job. It's about 78 minutes. But we have a delay in reporting findings because, you know, I'm going case by case by case by case. And so the idea is that you might have a hemorrhage on this head CT, and I'm going to go for all these cases before I get to this one. And so we've seen a lot of tools now from industry where, you know, they'll make triage tools where they'll say, oh, this one has a hemorrhage, or oh, this one has a pneumothorax. But one of the challenges is that that only solves one piece of the problem. You know, being able to detect a hemorrhage is, a, is only one issue of the clinical need. And when you talk to radiologists, you know, if you tell me that there's a hemorrhage, my first question is, where is it? Because I need to know, is it a false positive or a false negative? About 95% of head CTs will be negative. So if your algorithm is just saying negative, it's going to be right 95% of the time. A lot of times when I have a resident who says that I have a hemorrhage, and I'll see it in a false positive, and I'll say, okay, it's overcalled or undercalled. And so being able to see where the hemorrhage is really important for radiologists. When we talk to our neurology colleagues, they say, we don't really care about how fast you tell us because when a patient comes in with a headache, we are with the patient in the scanner and I can tell right away where, if there's a hemorrhage. What I care about as a neurologist is how much volume there is because that's going to go down a different treatment paradigm. And then when we talk to the neurosurgeons, they care a little bit about volume, but what they really care about is where is the location of the hemorrhage because that's going to dictate their surgical trajectory. So even though, even amongst clinicians, our needs change based on the kind of physician we are and the clinical scenario it is. And so I think that's why it's very important to engage clinicians very early on because we can tell you this is what I'm looking for. This is the kind of challenges that we have. And so this is you know, one of the things that we've done for trying to do a hemorrhage detection. And so we can see that the algorithm that we've made now uh, will actually show you where the suspected area of hemorrhage is to identify a true positive. So we can see subtle subarachnoid, hemorrhagic contusions, uh, extraxial hemorrhages. Likewise, the, the nice and important thing is it's also able, if it's showing us an area of hemorrhage, I as a clinician, I can say, oh, it's either a false positive or a false negative. And what this allows us to do is, let's say that the, hit, the algorithm says, I think there's a hemorrhage. And I look at it and I don't know where it is. I have to wonder, am I missing the hemorrhage or did the computer call a false positive? And that's why having these bounding boxes is very helpful. And I think this goes down to where, for AI, a, a common criticism has been that it's you know, typically a black box, but I think of, you know, one of the easy things that we can do is to use an ROI analysis or do an RCNN, and we can kind of see where the hemorrhage is. And here what we've done is we've broken this down to how a clinician approaches an image. You know, I have a head CT, and I don't make a single classification at CT. You know, we go for multiple region proposals. We hone in an area, and one of the things that we're able to do with head CTs is that we have that volumetric information. Um, a classic example for how we train residents is, if you're not sure if it's a hemorrhage, go a slice above, go a slice down, and confirm that way. And we're able to interrogate the information. And that's something that uh, my co-director, Peter Chang, was able to add those insights into how we design the architecture. And so you know, these are kind of the results that we had. And also breaking up the kind of hemorrhage um, that it is and also uh, the volume of hemorrhage. And then the last point for why is that clinical integration is not trivial. You know, in this example for head CT module, we'd had to go from the scanner to the packs to our death box and how to notify a clinician. And not depicted is all the steps that involve regulatory, compliance, the clinical validation, getting all the other radiologists to buy in to use this tool. What are we going to do after hours? How are we going to tell the radiologists? Are they going to get a text alert? Or are they going to get an email alert? What about for cases for a post-operative head CT? If a patient has a hemorrhage, they go to surgery, there's going to be blood on that CT after surgery. Are we going to notify the clinicians for, the, for those scans also? And then there's tremendous variation between scanners. You know, UCI, we have two different vendors, they have two different protocols, they have two different um, pixel densities and slice thicknesses. And so having something that is 
able to tackle that kind of heterogeneous data. So even though you might, ha you might have a very interesting application, there's a slew of steps that, as clinicians, we know how to uh, navigate. And then, you know, one thing I also really want to emphasize is getting that physician buy-in. You know, there is a lot of physicians who are nervous that are these tools going to replace me? Are these tools going to take my job? And then showing clinicians, this is how it's going to make your life easier or augment what you do or make you a better clinician. And there's a quote put out by the MGH people that I like a lot is that, you know, AI is not going to replace any doctor, but it is going to replace doctors who don't use AI or are familiar with AI. So I think it's important to have that discussion and that dialogue early. So this is an example of what we have running at UCI, if I get this to work. And so this is kind of a clinical trial that we have right now. Oh, it's not working. I'll try to get the video to work. Uh-oh. Can I play it from that slide? Yeah, you can just play it. Yeah, you can just play it here. Uh, That's weird. I'm going to use presenter for a second. Um, okay. No, that's okay. That is, I think it's because of the... It's because of recording? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, so the, the ongoing clinical trial we have right now, it's, uh, no? No. Okay, it's yeah. fine. So right now, at least at UCI, what we have is um, every scan, every head CT right now is being sent to our AI box where it's going for hemorrhage detection and it's letting the radiologist know yes or no, is there a hemorrhage? So that's one of the ongoing funded clinical trials we have right now. And um, we've since expanded that to work with our neurosurgeons and our stroke neurologists to round out the remaining stroke triage pathway. So now when a patient comes to UCI, the tools check whether there's a hemorrhage. If there's no hemorrhage, it will check if there's a large vessel occlusion for a stroke. And if there is a stroke, it will also check how much infarcted tissue there is. And so that's something that we're trying to uh, automate at UCI. And I think one of the you know, the advantage that we have at UCI is that there's tremendous clinical expertise amongst all the different types of physicians and clinicians. So, you know, these are the, some of the products that we're working with. So we're working with uh, Dr. Manuki on looking at core plexus. We're, we started working recently with uh, Dr. Anna Culver on looking at breast cancer. We're working with the ER on looking for spine trauma to look at areas of fracture detection. Uh, we're working with other neurologists to look at multiple sclerosis and how to uh, quantify demyelinating disease. So I think that's having that knowledge. And a lot of these projects, you know, like I'm a radiologist. I would never know even what I'm looking at. But talking to pathology, to able to tell you these are the features that are important to me. These are the questions I'm wondering. And so that's kind of that first part. So now kind of the second part is how to engage clinicians. And I think you know, some of this is going to have to be a paradigm shift because of how, how complex our data is. And the three main points are to collaborate early, often, and to uh, join us at our inter interdisciplinary conferences. So you know, I kind of want to stop first on you know, what is collaboration, and that's to work together in, in, in an intellectual endeavor. And this is the common clip art that you'll see when you look at uh, collaboration. It's the two people coming together with pieces, and we've built something together. The problem is that the reality is that a lot of times we have pieces and they don't necessarily fit. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. You know, in this situation, they know what the whole puzzle looks like. They know what they're trying to do, versus if I have a piece and come out you a piece, you know, even though some of it may fit, not all of it might fit. And so I think it's what ends up happening is that a lot of times collaborations have been, have been a very transactional relationship. It might be I give you data annotation, and after a month's time, I'll have a paper or some prelim data for a grant. And that sets us up for very short-term and conditionally motivated uh, relationships and that long-term and something that we really want to promote to have a long-standing community where we can keep working. And especially for medical technologies where you know, we had an example for hemorrhage detection and then the neurologist said, you know what would be really helpful is if you told us the different kinds of hemorrhage. So by having a more long-term relationship that focuses on the whole application or you know, what the end user is, we're constantly able to reiterate and remodify and adjust it to meet the different needs. And so that's why I think for when engaging clinicians, it's really important to engage early on at the inception of the idea, at the germination or at the ideation. And so that's kind of like the, the picture I had here. 
And you know, for most clinicians I've talked to, you know, they are very happy and very eager, and they want to collaborate. I think it's just reaching out to them. And you know, in terms of that, for how to reach out to us, I think the easiest way would be to join our inter interdisciplinary conferences. So this morning at 7 a.m., uh, we had our brain tumor board, and then right after that, we had our disease-oriented team meeting. And these are our research meetings where this morning we had uh, our neuro-oncologist, our pathologist, our radiation oncologist, the radiologist, and neurosurgeon in a single setting. And so and oftentimes we'll have someone present their research there and we'll see is this something that we can do a clinical trial with or is it something that I can give you data with and you have multiple different clinicians that you know maybe they find that it's something that I can do or something I can work with. Uh, an example that we had recently was we had a tool for a brain tumor segmentation tool and we thought that it'd be really useful to neurosurgery and they said it doesn't really matter to us because we're going to take it out but radiation oncology thought that was very very helpful for them because they would like to see what the volume is when they're planning their radiation therapy so so having this environment is very very nice and they meet frequently they meet at least once a month uh, i know for our dot meeting we meet the first friday of every month so we met today um, and then I think with the new website, they're trying to add these more so you can see when we're having our interdisciplinary conferences. And then in terms of meeting often, so this is a project that we're working on with Xiaowi, and this is for uh, multiple sclerosis detection. So we have multiple demyelinating lesions. And this is something that I think we can adopt from industry. Um, you know, a traditional engineering approach would be to use a waterfall process where we think of a, t we think of a tool and we go, through the, we go through the steps sequentially to deliver a product. Uh, whereas in software development, you know, it's much more an agile process. And one of the, you know, no pun intended, one of the benefits is that it's a very agile or flexible process. Whereas this goes right step by step by step, and one of the problems with this is that a lot of times the end user doesn't get to see what happens until they get to the final product. Whereas for this one, there's a constant reiteration and a lot of frequent meetings where we see what is the feature, what is the backlog, what is something new that I want to add to this, and a constant update for something that we had. You know, this is something that we did with Xiaowi, and I know uh, Peter was meeting regularly with Xiaowi's team. They would show us something, we would look at something, we'd say, you know, for this, this point of this, this lesion, you know, it would make more sense to do this, or why don't we add this feature? Um, and we were able to submit something to Makai that we're still all waiting to hear back. Uh, one thing to emphasize for Agile is that, you know, the downside from this is that there's a lot more meetings, there's a lot more collaborations, but in my opinion, in this setting, I actually think having those frequent meetings is helpful. Uh, something that you hear very common about Agile is that it's not efficient, but it's very effective. And I think that's something that we want to build, and you know, once we have a new product or application, we're still able to constantly redevelop and uh, iteratively go through it, and I think that's the advantage for this. So, in some way, for engaging clinicians, you know, I think for why to collaborate is because clinicians uh, have some domain expertise. Uh, we know how to tackle clinical integration, and we know what our clinical needs are. And for how to engage, I would say to engage us early, meet with us often, and to uh, join us at our interdisciplinary conferences. So, thank you. Any questions for Daniel? Okay. Very clear, thank you. So our last speaker of the morning is Professor Soren Brunak from the University of uh, Copenhagen. He's our keynote, first keynote speaker of the day. Soren is uh, famous worldwide for his work. Um, he has had several careers in his life. He started as an astrophysicist, then he became a bioinformatician. If you ever have used the Signal P program, it's produced by his group. It has uh, 100,000 citations or something like that. He then became a system biologist, Inte integrative system biology, I think, was uh, his title. And now he has. Uh, change one more time, and he's working on uh, electronic medical records. And of course, he has a little bit of an unfair advantage because he lives in a Scandinavian country in, in, in Denmark, and so he has a, they have excellent medical uh, electronic medical records, so he has access to millions of records from uh, Danish uh, patients. So we're very grateful for him to, to, to be here to visit us and, and to speak to us about his most uh, recent work. So.
So thank you very much uh, for the um, invitation. Uh, as you already uh, heard, um, Pierre uh, told you about the do do domain I'm working in and, and uh, being here and hearing about the new AI Institute is, um, uh, is great because this is, uh, as you already have seen in the, in the other presentations here, uh, it, it's, it's an area that needs AI and new uh, methodologies uh, like, like the ones you've, you've been seeing uh, before. So I have worked along with Pierre. Pierre's work has been a great inspiration also over the, the years in, in uh, machine learning for many years, but, but more simple models. Uh, and now it's, it's been so nice to see how these um, uh, deep learning approaches has, have uh, advanced the field, uh, field a lot. So diseases are most often studied one, and a uh, one at a time. And in this talk, we will sort of take a more global perspective uh, because I'm going to talk about disease trajectories uh, in a lifelong perspective. Of course, when we, during our lives, are getting sick, we are not just getting one disease. We are maybe getting uh, comorbidities, uh, follow-up diseases to the first disease we, we, we had. And um, one of the big surprises in the Human Genome Project was that we have so few genes. You've seen in the first talk that we're not having a lot of coding, protein coding data in the genome. But, but another surprise was that we only have around 20,000 genes. And, and when the Human Genome Project started, the anticipation was maybe that we would have 150,000 uh, genes and there would be a clear mapping between genes and, and diseases. But now we know that these um, genes that we have, they're actually uh, presumably involved in many diseases. It's not just one gene for one disease. So there's a lot of network biology also to be disentangled um, um, uh, here. And um, uh, so this seems not to... Uh, yeah, okay, we, we use this computer. So um, can I advance the slides? Yeah. Okay, there it is, yeah. So, so this is my first uh, slide here that sort of illustrates this um, lifelong perspective on, 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 on diseases. And we should really remember that this is complicated because we might start out reasonably clean in disease space and then we get the first disease and the second disease on top of that and, and the third disease. But of course, part of this is driven by, by genetics, but also by all kinds of, of exposures, including the drugs we get. Some of these diseases might also be treatment provoked. If we are treated for this cancer here uh, with radiation therapy, we might get one complication up here that we would not get if we had gotten chemotherapy. So it's really uh, complicated to disentangle what is going on. And, and what you're going to hear about in this talk is how do we try to figure out what, what are actually the highways in this disease space? Which diseases are we getting on top of each other? And what is the systematic in it, and then from that mapping effort, we might be able to go back and, 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 um, and find, find genes. So another trend that I'm sure many of you also are aware of is that while we in clinical data research have been focusing a lot on patient records when we get sick and, and, and looking at the data here, the lab values and, and, and the diagnosis and the procedures and all that, there's a lot of focus now also on the period where we are healthy. Uh, because um, a lot of the things that, that, that happen here actually also impact in, 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 in what direction we go over here. So we have in, in um, Denmark a large blood donor study where we just finished genotyping 110,000 um, uh, participants. This is sort of a good um, model for studying this process because blood donors are more healthy than the average 
person, otherwise they couldn't be blood donors. Um, and, and there are also a lot of blood taken from them, and we can actually follow up with a lot of measurements. And I will not talk about this project, I'll just mention that when we talk about analysis of clinical data and maybe matching it up against genomes and, and, and proteomes and so on, we should look more and more into this uh, life course period where we are technically speak speaking healthy because there's a lot of information that actually can be used down here. So what I'm talking about is not to stratify patients. This is what we want to do in precision medicine. We would like to take a group of patients and put them in, in various groups according to what treatment that would be best uh, for them. What I'm talking about is not to divide people in by a single biomarker or a single diagnosis or something like that, but actually taking disease trajectories and sort of stratify uh, the, the patients rather based on their, their pattern of diseases over, over many, many years. This is the, the, the idea with this type of work. Um, and of course we would like, when we have these diseases that co-occur in patients over here, uh, they might um, uh, um, arise because you have mutations, you start healthy, and then you have some rewiring on, of your gene networks uh, that, that, that give you these diseases. But if we should learn about what is actually going on down here so that we can use the, the, the genomes as biomarkers, we, we need first to find out which diseases are we actually getting together from some of these large population-wide data sets. And that's the focus that I will have in, in, in this talk. And this should, of course, in the end, um, end up in a more mechanistic understanding of diseases. Diseases are largely named after their symptoms, not uh, named after what is actually wrong, uh, molecular speaking, with, with, with the networks um, as, as they should. And here's a slide. This is not my own slide. It's a little bit busy slide, but it's Peter Robinson here in this New England paper from, from, from last year, where he sort of talks about, I can recommend this paper, on how we, we derive a new disease ontology that actually is more mechanistically uh, based and not just based on the symptoms that we have observed in the clinic for, 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 for years. Another um, aspect that makes it possible to study all diseases in one go is, of course, that uh, something like, like a proteome or a genome, this is a genome, this is from the Danish uh, reference genome that we published uh, a few years ago. When you sequence a person, of course, you get biomarkers for all diseases, essentially, that have genetic relation either as they, they, they give you a risk factor for get, getting a disease, but, but they might also have biomarkers that are important uh, for, for for, for selecting between uh, diseases. So many of these technologies are sort of compatible with this idea of moving to looking at all diseases and just uh, compared to just looking at them one at a time. So in the clinic today, we work with the international classification of disease system that actually has a long history. The ICD-9 codes that you get in the clinic uh, here in the US uh, mostly, I mean, this system goes back uh, more than 100 uh, years to this Bachelion classification that, that started out as uh, causes of death um, listing. And there was some harmonization made between some English and, and, and German and Swiss ways of, of, um, of dying. And this system uh, has been revised from, from years, so ICD-0 uh, was from 1893, and then you can see how many codes that has sort of been set into the, the um, uh, international WHO version of this uh, system. So in general, you can die from more and more diseases here, and you can also get more and more uh, diseases, so it becomes more and more fine-grained. But many countries, including uh, Denmark, have sort of made their own versions that might be more, more fine-grained, for example, ICD CD10 here was put in, in, in use in Denmark in 94, and we have around 20,000 codes in, in, in that. But this is the way we actually remember what diseases patients uh, had. And, and as Pierre said, in Scandinavia, we've been using a lot of this coding 
business for the diseases, also to provide sort of data that could be used in, in, um, in, in, in research, and they have not been uh, completely uh, synchronized, but for example, Denmark really didn't use ICD-9, as you knew, say we jump directly from ICD-8 to, to, to ICD-10. So there's a little bit of, of difference here, difference here but, but, but this is important for, for what we are going to talk about, because what I'm actually interested in is, in, is to take millions of people and all these different categories of disease. So chapter two here, it's the cancers, for example, and you see um, uh, uh, chapter 19 here, injuries and so on. Um, so all these different um, uh, diagnoses you, you can get. I ask a simple question, what is actually the order? Of, 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 of these uh, diagnoses. And um, if we look back 40 years, so in Denmark we got our social security number in 1968, and it was put into use also in the healthcare sector. So, so every person got this number. I remember when my father came and gave me my number uh, and said, if you, if you lose this son, you will cease to exist, he said. And, <laughs> And this is actually uh, more or less correct in Denmark. If you lose your number because it's used, it's pervasive. It's not like in any other country, almost even in Scandinavia. Uh, it's used for everything: your your gas bill, your bank account, your tax, and and your healthcare. Uh, but here you actually see over all these disease areas here, um, you see over 40 years. Uh, because our national patients registry started in 77, you can also go back, but we have different coding systems here, and we, when we were into actually mapping it, nobody had mapped ICD-8 to ICD-9 uh, before here. There's less codes, 8,000 codes here, 20,000 codes here, um, and very complicated. I will not go into that, and here you see sort of graphical illustration. We, we had some med school students um, working for, for a, an entire year making this mapping. And um, we can then uh, sort of uh, see, uh, uh, try to see the systematics in, in, in the diseases we, we get. And we published a paper a few years ago where we started doing that on, on a 20-year data set, roughly 6 million people. So in, in, in Denmark, we are actually, uh, oops, um, uh, we are 5.5 uh, million people currently. So here we can actually uh, include 4 million dead people. And they are, of course, the best, because uh, then we know how it ended, and we, 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 most of your diseases, you, you get the last five years that you, you, you live. Uh, so, uh, so we are uh, very grateful for, for, for those uh, data. But here you see the first 20 years. You see, for example, uh, if you look at the females and the males separately, you see all the pregnancy-related diagnoses. Here you also see for the inpatients and outpatients that breast cancer, the brown chapter here, it starts early earlier um, in females than, than in males. You can see a lot of, of things that sort of makes you confident that these data actually ref, re, reflect millions of disease trajectories uh, in a, in a population-wide fashion, because this is not like Medicare or something like that. In, in Denmark, we have a one-payer system, so this is babies, it's teenagers, it's, it's everybody um, added up together, and if we compute the same for the 40-year data, it, it looks very, very uh, similar. Uh, so so the, the um, idea is actually to try to see with these millions of trajectories what, what, what are the most frequent uh, ones, and then, as you saw before, try to stratify the, the patients based on the trajectories rather than single diagnosis. And, and we made, uh, now we're working with Pierre also on a deep learning model, but we had a very simple approach uh, first. We, 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 of course, are, we're interested here in progression patterns. We are not just interested in whether diseases co-occur because then they could be unrelated. We are inter interested in, in disease pairs where, where A is followed by B more than B is followed by, by A. So you can make it a simple binomial test and then you find some pairs that have direction and then you can put them uh, together into two trajectories and then you can, can count how many pa patients will, will follow. So this is the basic idea, but of course we need to build um, a um, a strong uh, deep learning model on this, and we're also working on that. But out of this comes sort of linear trajectories where you hop 
from one diagnosis to, to another. And here are some prostate cancer diagnosis, uh, the brown ones here and all other diagnoses, but you can also say I would want to summarize, for example, these four linear trajectories into a network where you can go in different directions, and then you can also put arrows on here according to how many patients will follow these different different steps. And for example, what we did here in the, the paper from 2014 was to look at diabetes, for example, and you see quite many people with diabetes diagnosis here, they start with, with asthma, uh, that turned out to be overweight uh, children, actually, that then have a light, uh, higher likelihood of getting um, um, uh, <coughs> diabetes, and then you see the complications uh, over here. So this is kind of a summary of uh, diabetes trajectories from 400,000 diabetics in, in, in Denmark followed over 20 years. You can also take COPD. You see COPD here is also preceded by some, some, some other diseases, and then you see respiratory complications here. So, so, um, so we've done a lot of that since we, we started that, we published a, um, a paper recently on, on cancers, essentially going across all cancers. I just show you seven cancers uh, here, for example, breast cancer in the top here. And time equal to zero here, uh, this is when you get your first diagnosis. And then we go, on this slide here, we go 10 years back. And we look at those diseases that are over um, they are significantly overrepresented before you get your 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 first uh, cancer diagnosis, and of course there is nothing necessarily causal in this. This is just descriptive. But for example, irregular menstruation here that you see with breast that you're not seeing uh, down here might ha actually have a relation here in, in the etiology of, 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 of breast cancer. But this is sort of the starting point of, of making hypotheses about how these trajectories are are different in different anatomical parts of, of, of the body. And of course, you can also draw them in slightly different ways where you, you keep the patients together in these trajectories so you see how they, they check in and check out of these different other diseases that, that, that you, can, you, can, oops, uh, you, can, you can get. And um, as we work across 20,000 diagnoses uh, to get statistics, we're still a small population even if we include the, the dead. If this could be done in the US with 200 million people, I mean, it would be, of course, much more, more, more powerful if you would clean up the situation today and then wait uh, 20 or 40 years uh, and then we would have some, some excellent data. The advantage in Scandinavia is that we have kept some, some data. But there are also really large data sets here in the US. I've been involved in several collaborations where we've used data from more than 100 million um, patients. They might not be sort of uninterrupted in the way we have it in, 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 in Scandinavia, but they are also really interesting and sometimes it matters with, with the large uh, numbers. You can also hook some of these diagnoses together if you would like to get more more um, more um, uh, statistical power. So you can use this this kind of thing for, 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 for many different purposes. With, with Pierre, we also try to study sex differences um, um, and, and, and see how these progression patterns actually differing between males and females. We know this is not data from, 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 from Denmark, from, from UK, that for example, if you look in different age groups, what are you dying from? The, the primary course and the secondary and so on you see with with, with, with with males it's heart diseases and so on but but with females it's um, it's cancer um, and and there's a lot of patterns here so we actually use these data to sort of cut the Danish population in half so we took seven million uh, patients and 3.5 million males and 3.5 million females and it was a paper that was published also earlier this year here and one of the results was that generally, if you just compute the average, uh, and here some there was a lot of news um, um, articles about about uh, this one here, a lot of inter in interviews with us. But but uh, in, in, on average, if you look across all these different disease areas, and you see what is the difference uh, in age at the first diagnosis of, of the given diagnosis that both genders can get, both sexes can get. Uh, of course, no ovary cancer and no prostate cancer so that has been taken out. Then in, in, uh, on average, females are getting the same diagnosis four years later than males. 
And, um, and this is, of course, as a, as a starting point, a good thing, because females have more disease-free years in their life. Uh, but of course, some of the delay here in diagnosis could also be that diseases are overlooked in, in, in females. For example, heart disease seems uh, to many clinicians to be primarily sort of a, a, a male uh, business. So, so some of these analyses can also highlight some of these um, issues. I just skipped this one. But we essentially made a map on how, if you take females over here and males over here, how you hop between these disease um, chapters in terms of how strong the uh, progression pattern uh, is, whether A comes before B or B comes before A. And you see many similarities, but you also see many dissimilarities. And now we started making these uh, trajectories uh, also so that we sort of uh, color the link according to how strong they are in the, in the, in the, in the, in the two sense. Uh, uh, sexes, and, and there's a lot of details in that area. If you're interested, you should look into the paper, but of course also underdiagnosis, for example, as I said, with the high di um, heart, di uh, heart diseases in, in females. Uh, in, in males, we also have, for example, a lot of underdiagnosis of osteoporosis, and this is what this network is, is, um, is showing. We actually made a um, video that uh, disappears. Uh, but often with these um, registry data, they're actually hard to get at. You need to ha have a permission and you need to work um, on it. Uh, but, uh, but we actually made a browser where you can plug in the diseases you would like to, uh, to study. It actually worked when we tested it um, uh, half an hour ago. Uh, but but uh, this browser, you can plug in the diseases you would like to study, and then it will pull out these networks that I've been showing um, you. And um, uh, and then um, you, can, you can try to study disease progression patterns in the Danish population, and of course also try to to compare them, uh, but we might uh, need to skip this uh, browser, but, but it's a new way to interrogate uh, such data on millions of people, because of course when I show a link between two diseases, I only show it if more than 50 people have had that jump. So there's nothing person sensitive in the in the data, um, and, um, and, and, and we can sort of, it's a little bit like Google Flights that we pre-compute all these transition uh, probabilities, but then we, um, uh, we can pull them out in this way in a non-person sensitive manner. So now I need to go to the next slide. Here can we, I think we got stuck in, um, yeah. So I want to shift to, to uh, an application of this that also uh, just came out uh, a week ago. Uh, and, and I've already mentioned um, uh, sepsis as one of the um, diseases we, 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 we study. But this is, of course, a, a very serious uh, business. And, and, and we published a few years ago also a paper on this. If you get a sepsis diagnosis here, um, if you take the Danish data and look back 20 years, uh, you have uh, patients with heart diseases, some have diabetes, some have uh, mental disorders, and, and, and uh, some of these also drink too much. And we have a lot of those in, in, in Denmark. We have a risky lifestyle. Uh, and actually, one of the shortest life expectancies in, in, in Denmark. It's not all fun, so don't laugh uh, too much. Uh, and what we actually put on here, with the sickness, it's not just the number of patients that follow a, a given link, but it's actually the, um, um, the probability that, that you are dead uh, 30 days after you got your sepsis diagnosis. And, and uh, this stratification that I showed you before um, uh, is also illustrated here that um, uh, we looked into the literature on, on, on sepsis and diabetes, and some papers said that if you had diabetes, your likelihood of, of, of dying from, from sepsis was higher. Other papers said the opposite. 
But actually, when we uh, stratify all the diabetes patients according to whether they, they are not really having any other serious comorbidities or whether they have cancer also or whether they have mental disorders, we could sort of rationalize the, the literature and sort of split the sepsis patients into three subgroups according to their, their longitudinal patterns, and, 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 and that could sort of rationalize all these, these details. But now we, we made a new uh, piece of work where we try to use these uh, disease trajectories directly in the, in the clinic, and it was a paper that came out in, in Lancet uh, Digital Medicine a, um, a week ago. It's a new journal. This was the second issue, and it's also a very interesting journey for this type of, of uh, work. So, so the idea is illustrated here, so now the machine learning uh, comes in. So we're interested in predicting mortality of uh, intensive care uh, patients. And um, the way you normally do that is that you, you um, pick up a lot of lab values and a lot of vitals and admission info, and then you, you might plug that into uh, a survival score. One of them is called SAPS, and in this case, we have compared to the SAPS 2 score. So you pick up some data during the first 24 hours of, of admission. And then we have 47 features um, uh, here. And uh, what we then add over here, so that's the normal way of doing it, is actually we take the disease history of each. We can actually, using this social security number, we can pull out the disease history of each uh, individual uh, from the from the database, and um, uh, we, we picked up uh, sort of uh, 270,000 ICU patients, and we also had a smaller data set where we had all these high-frequency data that we need over here. And then you can predict mortality either at the ICU uh, ward, or you can do it 30 days or, 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 or 90, 90 days. And then there's, of course, a lot of pre-processing of all these, these uh, data that you, you get out. And, and it is actually quite surprising result because if you would take a correlation coefficient and then um, try to see how many false positives and true positives do you have on, on dead, not dead, for example, at, at, at the ward, uh, this is the score you get uh, if you use this SAPS2 score. And, um, um, and you see the different models we have, have um, um, illustrated here. So if you just use the disease history before the patient came to the hospital, just that information is actually more powerful or more or less the same as the substitute score that is computed from the data picked up over 24 hours. And if you take the, the, the data that when you roll the, the bed into the ICU uh, and, and have a little bit of extra information, length of stay and so on, we are, we are, we are beating this sub two score. But if we put the two uh, time scales together, the 24 hours and maybe the 20 years here, so this was made on the 20 year data, we are getting a substantial improvement in, in, in prediction accuracy. And, again, and of course, these scores up here, you can just compute them before people come. To the, come to the hospital, and you see also the the um, um, the old rock curve over over here. And um, uh, when we, we look at, for example, subgroups of patients, for example, sepsis patients, I mean the sub two score is really bad, uh, and the improvement is is, is really uh, quite drastic for respiratory uh, patients. It's it's um, it's more. And it's interesting that you can play around in the machine learning approach with, with how you actually show the, the uh, 15 or 20 years of, of, of um, history to, to, the, um, um, to the algorithm. You can, for example, just use the chapters. Did the patient have a disease in this chapter? But you can also use the block structure um, of, um, of ICD-10. We have 227 blocks, so that's more fine-grained. And eventually, we could use the, the, the 20,000 codes, but then we would need more, more patients, and this is also illustrated over here. I think I will not go into the detail, but of course, if we had 100 million patients and we could do that, we could actually work with, with the fine-grained levels in ICD and presumably get an even better prediction. This is Keep, uh, this keeps going up, so, so, so this is what we learned from that. What was also interesting 
was that we could uh, try to um, understand the algorithm, how it works, and, and which parameters, for example, the top 10 um, features here, for example, the age. So high age is orange here, low is, is blue, and here you see where it, it contributes to, to death or to survival. And of course, high, high age is not good for you when you are at an ICU, but you can look at the different uh, values here and, and, and learn something from, from, uh, from that. But what is, of course, very important with these machine learning algorithms is, is that they are, it's not just taking these features independently because of all these connections. We can, we can um, look at the interactions between the features. And for example, the age, the strongest interaction partner, so we leave them out and, and we have various ways of, of quantifying how much the interaction means to the network. And for example, the top interaction feature here was diagnosis related to reproduction. And that turned out, so, so, so even if you have a high age, if you had diagnosis related to the production, then your risk is lowered. It's sort of illustrated down here. You have, have age here, you have a risk, but if you have diagnosis related to reproduction, your, 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 your real age is actually lowered. And then it, it, I asked the PhD student and Laura, what, what is this about? Yeah, it was mainly people who have gotten their ability to produce children back. So diagnosis related to reproduction. And I said to him, we cannot write this in a, in a, in a paper. <laughs> this cannot be, 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 be true. But it is actually true that some of these diagnoses that you have is also evidence that you're actually living an active life. Um, so in this case, the network picked up that you actually had some quite old people, but they had some surgery earlier in life that actually contributed to them surviving more often at, at, at the ward. And this is, of course, the power of the machine learning algorithms that they can, they can look at into all these correlations. There are many of them, and I will not go, go, go through them, but you can look in the paper uh, for them. So, so we are also using other architectures uh, on, 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 on this uh, problem. When, when we look at this uh, prediction here, of course, it's a simple feed-forward neural network, but, it, but, but, but there's no time involved here. We're just waiting 24 hours. We get these data, we plug it into the network, we get a survival score. But of course, what we would like to have in the clinic is actually uh, sort of a, uh, an hourly uh, prediction, for example, that we would like to have a survival score every hour, and this is what we also now have completed, uh, and, and this paper is close to, to, uh, to, to submission. And of course, also this LSTM network, we can go in every hour and look at uh, what is actually um, you know, drawing sort of the, the, um, the prediction towards uh, death or, or, or towards uh, uh, survival. And it's interesting that these features that are, are important for whether you are likely to die or whether you're likely to survive, they, they, they change every hour and you, you have them numbered here, but it's more the principle instead of going into the details of, of, of this. But this is a way you actually can use this disease trajectory information in the clinic. Very often we have research registries uh, in, in, in the epidemiology field that are mainly used for research. They are not used directly at the bedside. But this algorithm that we publish here is one example where you actually could plug out the data that the patient donated to the registry and you could actually plug it out uh, when, when, when you get to the ICU and then you could contribute to, to, to a better a prediction of your survival uh, possibilities. So just to, to, to finish here, I've just showed you, of course, uh, some, some disease trajectory analysis uh, in a very simple way because we've mainly been working just with a diagnosis. Of course, we can make trajectories at, at many of the other. We can take the, the, the drugs or the lab tests, and we can also look into the text, and we're also doing that quite a lot, but I will only uh, mention it because, of course, instead of, of taking the codes that the doctors assigned to the record, we can also pick them up from the 
from the text. This is Danish, you cannot read it, but might be able to see that this is schizophrenia and paranoid schizophrenia. Uh, but this is, of course, also done a lot in, in English and, and especially in the, in the US and in, um, in the UK. Okay, we started on, on this also quite some, 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 some years ago, and then you can actually plot these things into the trajectories. So if you have a trajectory here, and you find, for example, symptom that is statistically overrepresented between two diagnoses, you can you can plug it into your uh, trajectory, so you can sort of make um, networks that combine diagnoses and symptoms. So the blue uh, circles here are all the the symptoms, and you can even put relative risks on them uh, and say maybe one symptom is, is uh, decreasing the risk of getting this one, but it's increasing the risk of getting this other one. So you can combine this with with uh, text mining approaches directly on 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 the record. But of course, you can also pull uh, pull out structured um, uh, symptom information from the record. There's a lot of them. This paper is not out yet. Uh, yeah, out, uh, yet. It, the journal keeps uh, asking for minor revision and uh, uh, maybe the editor has a competing paper. I'm not sure, but uh, <laughs> I hope it will uh, come out. And, and, and we are working on, on, on large data sets also uh, where we have all these, these um, uh, data. We also have a lab value registry in Denmark with all the lab values that are being produced there. Every, every day, but, but um, in this case, it can be nicer on a smaller data set, for example, of 3 million patients for half of Denmark to, to have all the data um, collected in, in the same, in, in the sort of the raw, raw form. It can be used, for example, for polypharmacy analysis and also a domain we, we work in, um, mining the uh, adverse drug reactions, the yellow ones here out of the uh, record. And, 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 and see what, what, what is over represented. A few years ago, we, we published a workflow for how to deal with these adverse drug reactions. Of course, that can also be used on the polypharmacy problem because this is one of the large unsolved problems in, 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 uh, in healthcare data analysis. Uh, most of the papers deal with side effects for one drug, but, but like with the diseases, people have not really studied uh, all diseases in, in, um, in one go. Uh, maybe pulled out a few examples and so on, but we don't have it in a in a drug own um, complete uh, way, even if we have some, some data sets that are analyzed in this way because they're not covering the whole whole population and so on. So so what I've been telling you about here is this attempt to try to understand in what order we get diseases. Some of these diseases are caused by, by um, uh, our gene, uh, germline genomics. Some uh, are caused by, by um, exposures and treatment and, and, and so on. And, um, and, and this is at least one, one approach. And, and I guess it's a general trend now that this idea of just starting one disease at a time uh, is not um, any longer the only thing you, you do is another editorial that I can recommend from New England Journal where, where this idea of, of, of studying many diseases in one go is, um, is um, uh, described. And, and, and I think it's the interesting way of going with many of the big data and, and systems level tools that, that, that we have. Finally, I started saying that, that we have so few genes. But my group has also been involved in the NIH-supported project on, on illuminating the druggable genome, where we published a, a paper last year together with, with Tudor uh, Oprea. And, and, and in this paper, there was an interesting observation, uh, and I'd like to re return to that with the genes here uh, uh, as an end, because uh, if you just take the outer uh, so, uh, so, uh, the, the, the inner circle here, and forget about the outer uh, circle. So, so when we move into these 20,000 genes, we have 3% of them are actually drug targets today, and 6% are sort of in, in some kind of clinical trial, and there's a lot of literature on also a large chunk here. But actually, around one-third, there's not much literature on them. There's not uh, uh, virtually any patents. You can look into the paper. Uh, there's a lot we, st we still do, uh, do not know, as we heard in the first talks. And, and we think many of these genes are related to many diseases, and therefore they are not popping up 
in gene expression analysis of, of, of genes because they actually um, pulled in many different directions according to, 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 to the full disease spectrum. And, and, and it will be complicated to assign them, but I think an important step is to try to see what, what um, the order of the diseases we get actually uh, is. So finally, uh, I've not been mentioning much about socioeconomic status. Um, and um, when we look at these disease causes in, in a lifelong perspective, of course, where you have high social status or where you have a low uh, status, is known to impact, uh, of course, what we eat and our exposures. And, and um, we have not, in my group, worked much on, on that. But um, if you look down here, I mean, uh, now we have um, made a large collaboration with, with an organization called Statistics Denmark that will uh, keep all the income of, of uh, the Danes, um, all the education information is linked to the same number. Even the grades in exams, so we can stratify people whether they're good in math or bad or computer science. Um, they also made an industry I learned recently that links teachers to students. I mean, which teachers are pro producing good uh, students? You should have such a registry yeah, <laughs> as well. But they have all this socioeconomic uh, information, we, we, and we shouldn't forget that. I mean, we cannot just predict diseases from diagnoses and from drugs and genomes. There are many socioeconomic aspects that, that impact all this, and we should make sure that we uh, put this into the equation. And, and I think the deep learning approaches, the data compression, approaches that we also heard about in the previous talks. I mean, they are really good for this. Um, apart from that, I think we, we, we are trying sort of maybe to, to redefine disease as trajectories with, with some of these approaches. I think I'm out of, of, um, of time. But, um, but this is um, the, the idea with this mapping effort. It might seem boring, but I think it's actually uh, uh, very useful for patients. We saw it with sepsis and diabetes, but uh, I think it can be useful for many other disease areas to stratify the patients rather on their longitudinal patterns, maybe from 40 years of, of, of history, rather than just single diagnosis or, or lab values that you have, have, have picked uh, up. So a very nice group uh, here from one of our uh, retreats, so I uh, thank you to them, and many, many of them are mentioned here also on, 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 on the list. But thank you again for the invitation, and uh, congratulations to the AI Institute, and I'll be happy to answer questions. There's time left. There's plenty of time for questions. Yes, please. So I'm interested in whether you see ways to improve the electronic health record so that you can better predict and yeah, I think what happened in Denmark is actually that we got some U.S. products into our healthcare system, and it didn't really improve uh, the re records. And I know uh, also later speakers might uh, go into this issue that, that uh, I think the idea that, that a patient record should be clickable and the doctor should click and write is maybe a little bit old fashioned because for example, the text that we have in patient records, uh, I mean, it looked maybe 10 or 15 or 20 years ago that it would not so be so easy to, to analyze. But companies like, like Google have shown that even with unstructured data, you can make a lot of good analysis. So, so, um, so at least what, what this kind of work maybe contributes and also work done in, here in the US is to say that uh, I think we want the old fashioned patient record back. That's my recommendation. And I think we should ask the doctors to do what they're good at, dictate into a phone that might be linked to, to um, uh, automatic transmission into text and so on. Uh, I, I think doctors shouldn't click. That's my sort of, uh, they should rather do what they are used to. That's my view. Okay, two, two questions. The easy one first, uh, can you segregate the data to show that certain hospitals are doing better in intensive care than others, and is the government interested in that to improve hospital performance? They are very interested. Uh, and the question is, 
whether we want to tell them. Uh, <laughs> uh, but actually, I, I surfaced a little bit over it, but we actually, a little bit like you have in, in other analysis where you plug in the study center, we also plug in the hospital here, we say hospital A, and that actually meant a lot because different ICUs, these, the, these data come from different ICUs, and they're not having the same mortality and so on. So actually, which hospital you came from actually ha has an important uh, importance here. But it, it's a sensitive thing if you should make a real benchmark. But it's a very important question. Therefore, we are not disclosing what Hospital A is here in the paper and, and Lancet Digital Health. They accepted that because if we should have done that, we should have made a much more detailed analysis of, of that. But it, this is maybe one of the fundamental reasons that, why all these data have been collected for the last 50 years in Denmark. That is to follow up on, on, on efficiency in, in, um, in healthcare. So benchmarking uh, wards against each other is done a lot from this data. But in this paper, we are not going there. Uh, also, we had the theme of the previous talk where you would like to work with clinicians. We are rather interested in that collaboration rather than exposing uh, the patient data. Shouldn't the patient have the right to know this information? About yeah. No, but, but I agree com completely. But then you should make a, a, a serious paper just on that. And, and here we just took it in as a feature. And it might be that hospital A, they have much, many, much more sick uh, patients or less sick patients. So there might be, be um, wrong reasons for saying that this is the best. Uh, I think I know which ward I would like to go to in Denmark now. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I accept uh, that this is important, but it should be a serious uh, benchmarking analysis, uh, somebody mentioned the dream competitions and so on. It, it, it should be done in a serious way if we should get back to the patients on it. Yeah. This second question is harder. Since the costs go up as you approach the mortality stage, um, does the government have a right to this information to decide then at what point we're going to stop spending money? on this patient or this patient category? I mean, it's again a good and, and, and very difficult question because we have in Scandinavia these one-payer uh, hospital uh, health care models where we pay tax and we all get our treatment. But of course, decisions are made in, in, in the wards and we actually have fewer intensive care beds per, um, um, per person. Uh, in, in, in Denmark than, than I think uh, it is the case in, in, um, in the U.S. And uh, so decisions are made, uh, but, but they are, of course, uh, made by the clinicians. And, um, uh, and, and, and this is just a fact. Is I'm not saying that, that there is enough resources in the Danish healthcare uh, system to, to just prolong the treatment uh, uh, for, for, for years and years, but, but uh, I mean, this is not something we go, go into, but, but I would say there is a good, I think, delineation between the states and the regions in Denmark and then the clinicians who actually make the decisions. So I'm, I think people are quite happy about it, but of course, hard, hard decisions are made. But also to the benefit of the patient, because if the pa patient never will wake up again, it might not always be a good idea to, to continue the treatment, of course. But I'm, I'm not an intensivist, so I'm not so much experience in, in that. I'm yes, curious please. to hear about your experiences with the political implications of this data and how they might be leveraged in the U.S. in terms of, you know, for example, the privacy uh, sensitivities that you have there versus what we might have here and the lessons that you learned that could be applied here. Yeah, so, so, so in Scandinavia, people have traditionally had a lot of faith in the healthcare uh, system and maybe also in the States. Uh, so people are generally quite happy having their data uh, deposited, deposited with, with the state. And we actually have an opt-out opt model. So unless you, you opt out, you're in. So we, and this is not based on consent, because uh, then it would be difficult to work with, with 10 million patients, uh, as I did in part of the, the, the work here. So, so I think that's an important element, but that is, of course, a, a political uh, question. Um, and and uh, we have these data 
in very safe um, uh, environments. We, we bought a computer for 20, a new one for 20 million uh, euro um, uh, with a lot of security uh, around it. So I think we have a good security model around the, the, the data. But of course, if you want individualized care, you also need to plug out data for the individual. We cannot just go around saying we, we're only computing average statistics. Because as you, you saw in my intensive care algorithm here, I'm actually taking data from one person and plugging it into the algorithm and computing a score for that patient. And if people want that kind of benefit in their own treatment, of course they also need to be willing to, to, to have that lookup made. So, so, so we cannot just go around talking about personalized medicine in, in a way where we are not looking at individual level data, at least that's not what I try to come campaign for, so, so it's an important question, but of course data security is everything here, and I left those slides out, but I think we have a good model for, for that. In a supercomputer setting with a new 50,000 core machine and a lot of GPUs and so on, so that we can, we can actually make these um, algorithms work and also assemble a genome in, in, in six hours and so on when it's needed. And, no, uh, Rachel. Clinic. Hold up. Uh, I want to take the, the, the data into how it would benefit the individual. And, and I think that this is really amazing, really, uh, very impressive. Uh, nowadays, everybody wants to have their own medical records, uh, and, and they keep it and they follow up on it. How can the individual? use this kind of approach in order to predict what am I susceptible to, how can I prevent my next heart attack, uh, how do I benefit from this information at the individual level? Yeah. And can your next job to actually give that information and the know-how to the individual at the individual level? Yeah, so we actually have had this, a system for, for more than five years. It's called sunhood.dk. You can look it up yourself, health.dk, where you can look up your own record. Of course, you cannot uh, log in as Americans. You need your Danish home banking ID and so on uh, to, to log in, but you can look into your own record and you can, you can uh, look at the data and use the data yourself. So even if the data stays with the state and the public sector, you can also look into it yourself and you can use the data to get second opinions if, if you would like to, to do so. Uh, I think people log into their, their record quite a lot and also relatives log into the record together with, with, with their um, father or mother or whatever. Um, uh, so the login is for everybody who are uh, older than 15. Children cannot look, uh, log into their own record. But, but I, mean, uh, I mean, this is just access. It's not a, exactly what you say. It's not really facilitated that the data maybe could be transferred to other systems. Where, but there's also data security issues in, in that. But at least the data are made accessible to, to, the, to the patients. Can you add genomics data in? Yeah, we, we, we just started a national genome center that works in exactly the same way, where it's actually now compulsory in Denmark if you accept to be sequenced as part of your treatment at a hospital, you can, you can say, I will not be sequenced, whole genome sequenced. But if you say, yes, I would like to be whole, sequenced, uh, whole genome sequenced, or your, your child should be, the data has to go into a national database with this security around it, uh, so that the data are not lying all kinds of, of, of places in people's home and so on. They will be in a national database where you actually can pull the information out. So this new institute will start receiving genomes from, from July 1st this year. And there's a Danish foundation, the No Noise Foundation, that put a lot of money into that and has given around $150 million to jumpstart this and, and, and pay for all the sequencing of the Danes who, who wants to be sequenced, if their clinicians say that is a good idea. Peter. Uh, I'm wondering if you have looked at your data sets uh, in terms of whether certain diseases can protect, protect from other diseases data. So 
for example, if you know the medication that is taken from one disease, well, drop out uh, for other diseases. Yeah. This is a good question. I think many groups are, are doing that both here in the U.S. and in Europe also. Uh, Alfonso Valencia, for example, has been very active in, in looking for inverse comorbidities that seems to lower your, your risk. For example, schizophrenia patients, they have lower risk for getting certain cancers, and then people say that certain pathways are regulated in a way in schizophrenia that will lower the chance that you will get get, get cancer in, in, in certain um, tissues and, and so on. So, so, so these things might be built in, uh, the, these protection elements, but of course also drugs. Uh, so we are looking at that, but we haven't really published much uh, on it. We had a paper also earlier this year on, on chromosomal abnormalities, but but except for that, we have not really published anything on these inverse comorbidities. Uh, they are, of course, also sensitive to underdiagnosis and overdiagnosis. So, so one thing is that you have something that looks statistically significant. But, but uh, if HDHD, for example, is not recorded in a systematic way, then it might look like you have an inverse comorbidity. So, so, so it's, a, it's a really exciting area, but also one where you should be careful. I mean, the browser that we couldn't see will be put on the net, <laughs> and you can look up the disease trajectories and pull them out, as I've been showing them 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 here, uh, for for most of ICD-10. Um, but of course, the, the the underlying data are sensitive; they they are individual level data, and they have to stay um, in the secure clouds where we have them in Denmark. Uh, but but uh, I mean, you you can make applications for them. Normally, you have to collaborate with a Danish group, uh, but that's normally the the fastest way of of gain, gaining access to the Danish data. That is to collaborate with somebody and then. We have many collaborators, for example, who are sitting in other countries and working on our secure cloud infrastructures with the data, because then the data are not moved, uh, but might also spin up third clouds, where clouds from different countries might interact and all that, and people are working on technology for, for, for that. But as it is now, we're mostly inviting foreigners in to our secure environments, and then when you have signed a lot of stuff, you can work on the data. More questions for Soren? One, one last question, yes. Thank you. Well, my question is regarding ICU cares in your study. Um, one of the biggest controversies in the ICU is what type of medication are efficacious in what kind of diseases. Have you looked into the efficacy of medications based on your stratification? Yeah, that's also a good uh, question, but um, I mean, we have not in this, this paper, but the second last author, Anas Perna here, um, on, on, on here, I mean, he's an intensivist and, 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 and he's has a strong interest in that, that question. So here we have not taken drugs into the algorithms because they are not in, subst in the subs 2 score and so on, uh, but in the later paper, papers we are going to produce, we will look into that. But he's already also working a lot on that question. So no drugs in this particular paper. So. But thank you very much for the question. Okay, let's uh, thank all the speakers.